All the stories you know and love in a me sort of way, bringing religion, spirituality, and who knows what else. Listen to the pastor with the master battle the thunder from down under on religion. Ho-Ho's way. From the cottage studio, welcome to religion Ho-Ho's way. And as always, I'm your host, Ho-Ho. How y'all's doing? I hope you're doing good. I really do. Today, we're going to be talking about an amazing individual, a very unique person in the Bible, somebody that can claim something or at least make a claim that only one other person in all of Scripture can make. And I'm talking about the prophet Elijah. Now, as per the uniqueness of Elijah, like Enoch, whom we know very little about in Scripture because, I mean, let's face it, they don't really talk much about him at all other than he lived. He was Noah's grandfather or great-grandfather, I don't remember which. He walked with God and was no more. Just like Enoch... Elijah never died. Something that makes him extremely unique in the Bible. And, you know, Enoch, I, I would love, man, I wish I knew more about him. I really do. And, but unfortunately, you know, the Bible, canon, you know, the 66 books to make up the Holy Bible, don't have a lot on Enoch in there. But it, it makes you wonder, though. I mean, I got to be honest, it really makes you wonder because with somebody whom was alive just before the time of the flood. And, you know, with knowing how old Enoch was whenever he was no more, you, you know that he was alive during the time of Noah. That they knew each other, or at least was alive at the same place. Maybe not the same, or at least was alive at the same time. Maybe not necessarily the same place. But other than that, we don't, we don't know anything about Enoch. And, and that just makes you wonder, what the heck was so special about Enoch? You know, what did he do that set him apart from everybody else? I don't know. But we do know a lot more about Elijah. Excuse me. We know a lot more about Elijah. You know, Elijah... You know, there's, there's quite a bit mentioned in him. I mean, he spans two books in the Bible, First and Second Kings. And Elijah first comes up in First Kings chapter 17, verse, well, 1, I guess. But that's where he first makes his appearance. And, and you know, he, he continues into there. Now, I, I tell you what, though, of, of all the prophets, at least, you know, of the ones that we know about and we know some of their story— Elijah is awesome. You know, Elijah and I, we, we share something in common. You know, Elijah's got attitude. And boy, howdy, does he ever have attitude. And we will talk about that a little bit more later. But Elijah has some attitude. Now, here's one of the things about prophets. You know, they come about during times of need, during times of hardship, during times of you did something wrong, you better straighten out or bad stuff's going to happen. Sometimes it's just a, you know, you screwed up. This is how you screwed up. And unfortunately, God has noticed and you're going to have to pay the piper. There's some bad stuff coming. And, and that's where... Elijah first makes his appearance. He gets, you know, called by God to talk to, oh, what was that guy's name? Um, uh, I, I forget what the guy's name is. Ahab, 
A H A B. Yeah, Ahab telling him that a drought, a seven year drought, not a, just a little bitty drought, a seven year drought is coming. Why? Because Ahab, king of the Jews, king of Israel, allowed his people to start worshiping false gods. And God wasn't having it. You know, God was not having it. It's like, dude, I didn't do all this stuff just to have you guys ignore me. You know, and, and this is something that has been very common throughout Israel history is they come to God, they do some stupid stuff, they go their own way and start worshiping false gods. God take notices, sends a prophet, you screwed up, some sort of punishment, and then redemption, and then they go back to God. That's just kind of how things go. That's how things have happened pretty much all throughout Israel history, all throughout the Bible. And, and that's one of them things, too. The book of Hosea, Ho Hosea, I don't remember how exactly you pronounce that, but that that right there is is a book that is, you know, it, it lines up with the relationship between God and his people, you know, and it's kind of like a mirror type of a thing. You also have heard my explanation of what a parable is. It is an earthly example of a heavenly principle. And the story of Jose and his wife is very reminiscent about the relationship between God and the chosen people of Israel, the nation of Israel. So very, very interesting. So again, just like in most of, you know, the word, Israel screws up and God calls a prophet. And, the, and this time it's the prophet Elijah. So the drought ended seven years later. And I don't exactly remember how many times that, or at least how many years after this happened. But, yeah. But, but the most, okay, the, the most awesome part about this, all right, is, you know, and, and you, you remember whenever I said that Elijah had, he had attitude, you know, that he, he uh, you know, he, he threw some jabs with, with some stank on it. All right, because there was a showdown that happened. Okay, after Elijah went to Ahab, told him, you know, told Ahab that, look, y'all screwed up. Your drought's coming. And, you know, in, instead of, you know, turning away from the false gods and trying to, you know, get back on God's good graces, instead, is what Ahab decided he was going to do was, was kill the prophets. I don't know why sometimes, instead of fixing the problem, it's let's get rid of and kill the people who pointed out. At, you know, kind of thinking that, well, if the prophets are all gone then God won't see what we're doing and maybe the drought will end. And that's, I guess, that's what the mindset was of Ahab. I don't get that kind of a mindset. I really don't. You know, God notices, God called the prophet, said, let him know, take care of the business, and, and, and then there you go. And instead, they evidently thought that the only reason why God knew what was going on was because of the prophet. Their problems were coming from the prophets. So Ahab sought out to kill all the prophets. That was a good idea. And I think it was like the fifth year, maybe, that, that Elijah had a showdown with the priests of Baal, B-A-A-L. 
Now, this was pretty freaking hilarious. It really was. Okay. And I don't remember exactly how many priests it was. You know, it, it was at least, um, I'm, I'm wanting to say it's like either 450 or 420 uh, priests of Baal that he went up against. But he told him, he goes, hey, look, okay, this is what we're going to do. Okay. We're going to have a showdown. All right. Between your God and my God. All of you, 450 strong priests of Baal versus one little old me and the God of Noah, the God of Abraham, the God of all these people, the God of Israel, the true God, the one true God of Israel, we're going to have a showdown, okay? Grab bull, all right, or grab two bulls. You pick out the one you want to use, build your altar, do everything, okay? So the day began, they picked out their bull, they prepared it, you know, to sacrifice, and, and they, started, they started praying to their God. They started praying to Baal. And like six hours passed, okay? And this all takes place on Mount, Mount uh, Carmel. And let me, let me actually look right quick because uh, I, don't, I don't remember where this actually takes place. Okay, okay, okay. So uh, 1 Kings chapter 18, starting on verse 16. That's, that's where this showdown takes place. And this is an awesome showdown. It really is. This story is so cool. So, you know, they're praying. They're wailing to their God. You know, and, and after six hours of them praying, or at least, you know, six hours after everything got going, because I don't know how long it took them to, you know, make their altar, get their, you know, get the, the sacrifice ready. You know, I mean, you'd think with like 400 plus of them, you know, doing all this, that they would have divided the work and it, and it would have started relatively quick. I mean, that's what you would think. That's what I think. But it doesn't really say. So at noon, okay, so, so this started at sunrise, which roughly at, at the time frame was around 6 a.m. And, and this carried on until noon for six hours. They're praying. Remember how I said that Elijah had, had, some, had some attitude? This is where that takes place, all right? Because Elijah, he, uh, he hollers out. I mean, he's watching all this take place, okay? And he's like, um, maybe your God is busy. You know, maybe he's, you know, just deep in thought. Maybe he can't hear you. Maybe he's, maybe he's sleeping. You know, pray louder, and, you know, maybe he'll respond to what's going on. I mean, there's 400 of you people. You know, what's, what, what the problem is, okay? So they start praying louder, all right? They start cutting on themselves with, with spears and, and whatever until their blood started flowing. That's how it words it in the Bible. Their blood was flowing. And then finally that night, it's like, okay, fine, we're done. We give up. You know, this lasted from sun up to sundown, and and our God did not answer because that that was the thing. Okay, it was build your altar, prepare the bull, your blood sacrifice, pray to your God, and your God lights the altar on fire and burns the sacrifice himself. Okay, that was that was the bargain. Okay, that was. You know, that was the showdown between Baal and the true God of Israel. And then this is what Elijah did. Okay, he, uh, he built, he constructed the altar that apparently was, was already there. You know, it was already there. They, you know, they had torn it down because it was an altar for God and, and you know, their new lesser God was Baal, and, and so they had to destroy God's altar. So he, he kind of put it back together, okay? There was, you know, it, it says that there was like 12 rocks, one for each of the 12 tribes of Judah, and or tribes of Israel, and, um, you know, he got the wood ready, and he prepared the meat, put the meat up on there, and then is what he did is he, he had some servants dig a trench, around the altar, all the way around the altar. 
it specifies a depth in there. I don't know exactly what that depth would have been. I don't know. I mean, I know I know American measurements. I don't really know a whole heck of a lot outside of that. But he has him dig a trench around it. And then he goes, hey, I want to step it up a notch. I want to make this interesting. I want you four people to get four large jars, fill them with water, and then bring it back and dump it on top of the altar. Dump it on top of the meat, get the wood wet, get everything wet, and and keep doing it. Okay, so you're talking probably, you know, a five-gallon jar, roughly, I'm I'm assuming, a five-gallon jar, four of them. So you're talking a good, what, 20, 20 gallons worth of water. Fill them up, dump them on the altar, dump them on the sacrifice, get everything wet. And then they did that. Okay, so you're talking 20 gallons right there. And then he steps it up another notch. He goes, hey, do it again. Now we're talking 40 gallons of water thrown on this. He steps it up a notch again. He says, do it one more time. A third time, they fill up these jars of water. So we're talking a good, what, 60 gallons of water at this point covering the, the sacrifice, drenching the wood, even filling up the trench that was around it. That's a lot of water. That's a lot of water. <laughs> he does all this, and then finally, he prays to God. And fire came down from heaven and lit that puppy ablaze burnt everything. I mean, holy cow. What a demonstration of power. That is so freaking cool. That story is awesome. You know, because, I mean, it tells you just how powerful God truly is. I mean, think about this. This happened after the Exodus. Y'all know what happened with the Exodus, the ten plagues of Egypt. You know, Moses guiding his people away from Egypt and into the promised land, spending all this time going around in, in uh, the, the, the desert, you know, the Horn of Africa, all right, Go, going around all that. And it's like, with all of the demonstrations of power, of God's power, his dominion over all of creation, how can God have dominion over all of creation? Because he created everything. Of course God has power and dominion over that. It is so cool. I mean, it doesn't get much better than that, guys. It really doesn't. As a prophet, that is absolutely amazing. So, so cool. It really was. But un instead of turning from their ways, instead of getting right with God... they were kind of ticked about it. You know, they really were. They, they were upset. You know, they had just been humiliated and disgraced. 400 plus priests of Baal versus one teeny tiny prophet of God, the almighty Elijah. They were not happy about this. And so they, they, they kind of was like, you know, we're, we're going to, we're going to track you down. We're going to, we're going to hunt you down. We're going to kill you. Elijah was scared. Rightfully so. I would be too. I mean, granted, I mean, he just had this big old showdown. God just showed up with a big old fire blaze that came out of heaven, scorched, you know, scorched earth on that thing. And, you know, that's pretty stinking awesome. Pretty stinking awesome. And he hides out in a cave. And God's like, come out of the cave, or at least go to the mouth of the cave. I want to talk with you. I'll show up. There was this big old windstorm, gusts of wind. God wasn't in the wind. There was an earthquake. 
God wasn't in the earthquake. And then there was a gentle breeze, a whisper of a breeze. God was in it. He came out, Elijah did, came out of the cave and spent some time with God. You know, that is, that is so cool. I mean, yes, God has been in those other things, the devastation, the destruction. But the true presence of God isn't found in the storm. It's not found in the destructive powers of nature. The true presence of God is found in the whisper. The gentle breeze, the peace that comes, regardless of the storm, regardless of the earthquake, that's where the true presence of God resides. It's in the peace. I thought that was so awesome. That was so cool. Wow. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? That's cool. I, I always loved that part of the story. You know, yeah, the showdown on Mount, Mount Carmel is, is awesome. You know, Elijah just laying the smacketh down on 400 plus priests of Baal. Having that faith that God would show up, not just show up, but to set that sucker ablaze amidst everything that he did. The 60 gallons of water drenching the sacrifice, drenching the wood that was supposed to be lit ablaze and burn the, the, the offering, but also the, the entire area filling the trench with water that was dug around it. It doesn't get harder than that, people. And God showed up. That's awesome and amazing enough as it is. But to hear that God was like, I want to talk with you, and have these displays of power, but God wasn't part of the destructive force. He wasn't there. He wasn't present. He wasn't in the bad crap that was going on. It was a gentle breeze that showed up, and, and I don't want to word it like this, but it showed up afterwards. But in our own lives, that's that's not how it happens. That's not how this whole thing goes down. You know, I, I've told people that whenever it comes to, a, you know, being a Christian and walking with Christ, it, it's not that you're not going to be put in these type of situations. It's not that bad stuff isn't going to happen to you. It ain't about any of that. But what it is about is God gives you this, this peace that can only come from within and can only be given to you by God himself. This peace that goes against all understanding, everything that we think we know. Because within the storm, God changes our outlook. It's not that the storm isn't destructive. It's not that it, it shouldn't, you know, its destructive power shouldn't be respected. That you shouldn't have a, a particular amount of you know, I'm just reservation toward it. But it doesn't need to, nor should it, control you. Because God changes our perspective. Because this storm that's going on in our lives, we have the ability, through our connection, or with our connection to God, through Christ, it's that, it's not that bad. We can see beyond the storm. Even if it isn't through our physical eyes, we can see it with the faith that we have. We can see what's going to happen on the other side. We know this. It's not a question. God already gave us the answer. He, we know how it's going to end. We know that they can do what, or they're going to do whatever they're going to do. They're going to stack the deck against us. But just like with Elijah on Mount Carmel, they're not going to win. 
Because even with the odds stacked in our favor, a prayer. And that's all it took. A simple prayer. Elijah wasn't praying for hours. He wasn't doing that. He didn't beat his chest. He didn't do anything dramatic. I mean, it basically just says that the man got down on his knees at the altar and prayed. And God showed up. God showed up. And then in the mix of the storm, whenever Elijah's life was threatened, when he was facing certain death, if he was discovered, he was at the mouth of that cave, and God said, dude, go there. I want to talk to you. I want to have a conversation with you. Go to the mouth of the cave, and and I'll be there. I'll show up. And he did. That is so cool. You know, it is it is so cool. And then you have, all right, there's, there's a couple other things in there, you know, um, Elijah bringing somebody back to life. Um, and that that, that that I just talked about was a meeting at Mount Horeb, H-O-R-E-B, and that's at 1 Kings 19. Um, oh, yeah, that one's actually pretty cool. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Calling down fire on soldiers. That was that was kind of funny. But let's talk about Elijah and Elisha. I'll tell you what, I gotta be honest with you. You know, I, I hate the aspect of, you know, these two people being so close in their name that it's like, which one was the apprentice and which one was the master? You know, what, what, why couldn't he have made it Bill and Ted or something? Why couldn't it have been Jay and Silent Bob? Okay, why couldn't the names have been different enough that it would be easy to know who's the master and who's the apprentice? But, oh, no, God's like, I'm going to choose, you know, Elijah and Elisha. I'm just going to purposefully do this so I can confuse everybody. And I always have issues with this. I really do. I ain't going to lie to you. You know, remembering which is which. I always have issues with this. Always. But this is what's interesting, because not only did God choose Elijah, but he also chose Elisha. He chose both. I mean, which is fitting. You know, I mean, whenever you're going to have this type of a gift set, you, you know, God, God chooses his people, you know, and I'm sure God had, it, had his reasons, but he, he picked him out personally and said, that's my guy, my guy. That's who I choose to take your place when you're no longer here. I choose Elisha. And so Elisha, you know, he was, he, he knew what's up, okay? You know, because towards the end, and this is, this is, this is so cool. I mean, this really is a neat story. It, th- this one really is, you know. God's like, I want you to go over there. And Elijah's like, okay, sure. And, and he tells Elisha, and, and he's like, well, that's fine. You can go over there, but just so you know, I'm coming with you. And they get over there, and, you know, some other prophets that are in the area kind of, they go to Elisha and they say, dude, look, Elisha, um, I don't know if you know this or not, but God's going to take Elijah today. Before this day is over, he's going to take Elijah, and, you know, it's going to happen. And so he goes to You know, whenever Elijah talks to Elisha and says, hey, we're going to go over there. And he's like, yeah, and I'm coming with you. You know, you ain't going without me. You know, Elisha knew what was up and Elisha had some some ulterior motives in this. Okay, he wasn't just going to be left behind to be left behind. You know, he knew the 
the job that God wanted him to do. I'm, I'm sure that he did. On some level, he knew what was coming. Otherwise, why would God have specifically chosen an apprentice for Elijah? So Elisha knew something was up. Elisha knew that something's going on here. And, and I want to give myself as big as an upper hand in what's coming that I possibly can. And, and whenever he gets to these other prophets, are like, Dude, yeah, he's taking them. And, and Elisha's response was, I know, shut your face. Don't talk about it. Leave it alone. And then God's like, go over here. Because God wanted to kind of separate the two, okay? God... God knew what, what Elisha was up to. He knew what Elisha wanted. And he was going to make Elijah, Elisha work for it. I think that's what a lot of this amounted to. You know, was, if you want it, bring it. If you want some, come get some. If you can't handle it, then, then just stay at home. You know, you want some, come get some. That's what God was saying. You know, it's just, it's on. I know what you want. I ain't just going to give it to you. You got to work for it. You got to show me you want it. Show me that you're willing to go the distance. You want this? You want me? Come at me, bro. And Elisha did. He's like, okay, so God sends you over there. I'm going over there with you. And this was round two of God going, go over here. And again, Elisha says, that's cool but she ain't going without me. And then they get over there. And again, prophets come around to Elisha and it's like, um, dude, God's going to be taking Elijah today. And again, Elisha says, I know this, shut your hole, keep your mouth shut. We don't need to talk about this again. Okay. This is so funny. And then again, a third time, God goes, go over here. And Elijah tells Elisha, now we got to go over here. We went from here to there, and then from there to over there, and then from there, now we got to go over there. And again, Elisha goes, that's cool, but I'm not leaving your side. If you go, I go. That's all there is to it. And again, some prophets of where they were going to says, Elisha, God's going to take your master today. And again, Elisha says, I know this, shut your hoe. Keep your mouth shut. I got this. I know what's up. You think I've been doing this crap all day for nothing? No. And then finally, now I don't know when exactly this takes place. If it was on the road to number three or if it was, you know, going somewhere else, you know, I don't exactly remember when this took place, when this conversation happened. But finally, you know, Elijah confronts Elisha. It's like, look, you want something, okay? You know what's going on. You know what's going to happen. You know what's happening today. So tell me what it is I can do for you before God takes me away. What can I do for you? What do you want? And Elijah responded with something that is, I mean, dude, when I say that Elijah had attitude, okay, which is very clear and very apparent whenever you, you read the story of what happened on Mount Carmel. But Elisha had intestinal fortitude. Elisha had balls of steel. Let's be clear. Because what he said was, I want a double portion of what you got. Your gift, your power, your mantle 
of authority and power. I want a double portion. Whoa. That takes balls. Let me explain to you why, okay? When you are talking, oh man, how do I want to do this? Okay, there's there's a difference between There's a difference between having the gift of a prophet versus being a prophet. There's a difference between having the gift to teach and being a teacher. There's a difference between having the gift of ministry and being a minister. There's a difference between having the gift of evangelism and being a true evangelist. And the difference is that mantle of power, that mantle of authority, that specific calling of God that says, I pick you. That's the difference. I mean, granted, don't get me wrong, okay? We all have gifts. And in the Spirit, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 and whatever, we all have one of those five, you know, offices of the Holy Spirit. We all have them. In a lot of ways, in some ways, we all have every single one of them. How we exercise it, differs from person to person, but we all have the same type of calling, but not everybody who has the gift of prophecy has the charge and the mantle of power that comes with being a prophet. And Elijah had that mantle of authority and power. But it goes deeper than that. Okay. A. Okay, so we talked about the mantle. But as a prophet, that that mantle is is linked to something called anointing oil. Okay. And that oil. Is, is a physical representation of that mantle, okay? And a prophet only has so much oil. So what Elijah was saying was, whatever amount of oil you have, that, that, that however big that, that jar was, that, that wineskin was, that, that bladder that held his anointing oil, however big that is, I want a double portion of that. Now, here's the thing. Elisha knew that that was outside of Elijah's power, that he, he can only give him, he can only gift to Elisha what he had. And Elisha wasn't asking for that. He was asking for more. He was asking for double. It's like, I know what's up. I know something big is going to happen. And I know that God chose me for a reason. I know that God is taking you for a reason. I know all of this is going on for a reason. God knows what's up. I know what's up. If I'm going to do this, if I'm going to follow through and whatever charge God gives me, I need that double portion. And Elisha knew that the only place that double portion can come from was God. Elijah only had so much. The rest had to come from God. 
Elisha knew it. Elijah knew it. God knew it. <sighs> Elisha had balls. It would have been easy just to allow him to go the first time. You know, it would have been easy for Elisha just to let Elijah go the first time and, and allow him to be taken. But he didn't. He said, you got what I need. But I need more. It would have been easy for him just to relinquish the control, but he was like, no, I can't do that. There's something going on. I just, there's something going on, you know, that double portion. He had intestinal fortitude to go, I don't just want what you got to give me. I need more. And all of them knew that that more had to come from God because Elijah only had so much. And Elijah, Elijah's response to that was, okay, I can only give you what I got. That's it. What I got is all I can give, and I can't give you no more. If all I have is one ounce, then all I can give you is one ounce. If all I have is one mantle of authority, of power that is only so big, then that is all I can give you. I don't have any more in my possession. I do not control anything more than what I have. This is all I can give you. However, if you are present when the Lord comes and takes me away, then you will have what you're asking for. What? Are you serious right now? God's going to choose the time and the place whenever he takes Elijah. God can orchestrate and make it to where Elisha ain't there. That was an act of faith that if I'm needing double what it is that you have, then the rest has to come from God. And Elijah acts in an equal amount of faith by going, hey, if you're present when I'm taken, then God will give you what it is you're asking for. He will give you that double portion. That is so cool. Holy crap, are you kidding me? That is so cool. And show sure enough, a chariot comes down, takes him away, and Elisha receives that double portion. He receives the power, the authority, the gift, the mantle, a double portion of what Elijah had. It's not to mention the very mantle that Elisha had too. Elisha had his own mantle of power. He was a prophet as well. He knew what was up. And this is another part that this just hit me because this is super cool too because Elisha already had not just the gift of prophecy. He was a prophet. He was chosen specifically by God to carry out God's prophetic mission, to carry out God's, to carry his message. He already had his own mantle of power. He already had his own portion that God gave him. And then he asked of Elisha, or I'm sorry, Elisha asked of Elijah his portion and an equal portion of that from God. 
So Elisha walked away from that experience, having his own mantle of power, having his own gift, and then a double portion. Everything that Elijah had and an equal amount from God. Wow. Are you serious right now? That is, dude, that is so cool. That is so cool. And I was, I was kind of talking a little bit about this earlier, okay? Talking about there's a difference between having the gift of prophecy and being a prophet. And like I said, I mean, that is a specific calling from God. Because in, and, and this is true for all of the offices, okay? It really is. It's the same for apostles as it is prophets and evangelists and pastors and and teachers. It is the same for all of them. You know, we all have these gifts. God calls them to use it. But for some people, God calls as leaders of and above and a specific calling to do more, to go out on a limb, act in faith, do certain things and and really exercise the gift that was given to him. And it was a gift. All of those offices, it was a gift. Truly, it was a gift. God sometimes calls more. And that is what it means to have the mantle of power and authority. You see, Elijah just wasn't a prophet. He was called by God. Prophets have a bad rap. You know, Read, read about your prophets, okay? There's Isaiah, there's Elijah, Elisha, there's Jose, there's um, Isaiah, Daniel, Jeremiah. There's a lot of prophets out there. And believe me when I tell you, it's, it's not a glamorous gig to have. It really isn't, okay? Because prophets are called by God to basically call out somebody, a nation, a king, a people, call them out on their Bravo Sierra and said, straighten up or something bad is going to happen. Or it's because you've done this, you're going to get that. And then they get pushed out of the church. They get, they got, they get ridiculed. They get spoken down of, they get tracked down, hunted down and killed. Cause that's what happened during Elijah's day. Prophets were being tracked down simply because they were prophets. It's not a glamorous gig to have. It really isn't. Being a prophet in the Bible freaking sucks. There's no other way. You can't sugarcoat that. There's no better way to put it. It sucks. You get told by God to do something like, can can you, can, I mean, real, can you blame what happened why Jonah said, uh-uh, I ain't doing it. No, because God was like, I, I, I need you to go over there, and I need you to tell these people something. And, and Jonah's like, mm-mm, no. Uh-uh. You, you, you don't think I know? You don't think I've read? You know, you, you don't think I know what it's like being a prophet? You don't think I know what it's like to go tell people, stop doing this, you're screwed up, and, and if, if you don't, then bad things are going to happen. And, he, and he's like, no. Uh, uh-uh. I mean, Jonah's, you know, he, his reasoning was different because he was like, dude, okay, uh, if I tell them and, and if they turn away from their, their wrongful ways, then, then you're just going to forgive them. And then in time, they're going to slide back and do what they did. And, and, you know, God was like, well, that ain't for you to judge. That's for me to do. And, and your job is to do what I tell you to. Don't worry about the aftermath. I got that covered. Jonah's reason was different. Granted, 
I give you that. But even still, it sucks being a prophet. You do what God tells you to do. You're ignored. You're ridiculed. You have to fight sometimes for your life. You are banished. Banished. Did you love that one? You're banished. You're kicked out of the house. You're, you, you get booted from the protection of. And really, the only one you have to, the only one you got is God. You got to rely on his protection because you no longer have the protection of the church. It's not, it's not glamorous is what I'm saying. It ain't glamorous being a prophet. Of all the offices, being a prophet sucks the most. Because you are called during times of great struggle, of hardship, of suffering, because somebody screwed up, and now you got to go over there and help them fix it. Tell them what's up. You got to be God's messenger. You got to act and walk in faith. You got to do something that nobody wants to do. Nobody wants to give that kind of information. You know, I mean, whenever he was called to Ahab, it was, um, you've done something stupid, you need to stop. Because it's going to be a drought. Ahab didn't want to hear that. What was his reaction? Ah, oh, dude, you're right. Man, I'm sorry. My bad. I'll go back and worship the one true God of Israel. Was that what happened? No, it wasn't. What happened? Oh, you have the audacity to come to me and tell me, a king, the king of Israel, that I'm doing something that I shouldn't be doing. You have the audacity to tell me what to do. I'm king. You're right. But God is God. And if you don't straighten up, then there's going to be consequences. Ain't nothing you can do. And you got like, you know, with, with Daniel, we talked about that. Daniel. What was it? Yeah, Daniel. Talking to the king, King Nebuchadnezzar. Um, this is what's going to happen to you, to your house, to your kingdom. It was a, you need to straighten up. There's something you can do to fix it. No, 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 there was none of that. It was just, hey, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but this is, this is what's up. This is what the dreams you had are telling you. This is it. This is what's up. Oh. My point is it ain't glamorous. But every age has them. There are prophets in today's age. There are people that are out there that are banging their drum. And begging people to listen. There was a time when I would say that, okay, now normally I wouldn't do something like this, but you know what? I mean, it's got to be said. There was a time when I, there was a time when you can separate yourself. From this, that, and the other. You know, um, religion from politics, politics from life, life from work, and work from personal and everything else. You know, and, and some people can compartmentalize like that. You know, some people can keep it separate, at least to a point. You know, and, and there's ethical reasons and what not to do it. And, and I get all that. And, and I'm not saying that it can't be done or shouldn't be done. But what I'm saying is, does, is it really, not, you know, because like, dude, because, you know, my faith 
is very much tied in a very significant way to who I am. My political views is a reflection of my faith, is a reflection of who I am and what I believe and everything else. You know, you, you can't separate yourself like that. Because you're not being true to you when you do. You're, you're leaving something behind. You know, Peter was ridiculed for denouncing God, Jesus, three times. Three times before the cock crows, you will deny me. That's what we do. When we separate our lives, we're denying that our faith has any part in who we are. I, for one, have a hard time doing that. I mean, granted, I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm not, you know, walking into the room singing, you know, or walking into the building singing you know, praise and worship songs. You know, I don't, I don't do that. I'm not going to do that. But I got to be true to me. And I recommend that. You know, I really do. You'll feel better for it. Yeah. You'll feel better for it. <sighs> Elijah's story, man. It is, it is, it is a good one. Elijah... Elisha, wow, two amazing, powerful prophets. Elijah being unique in the fact that he could claim something that only one other in all of the Bible can claim, never dying. Enoch walked with God and was no more. Elijah got carried away on a fiery chariot. How cool is that? So awesome. So awesome. Guys, that's, that's all I got for you today. Really, that's, that's it. You know, the next episode, what are we going to talk about after this? I don't know. Let me, let me take a quick look at stuff. Let's see, we did, we did the Tower of Babel. Did we talk about the prodigal son? I think we did, actually. I think we did. Story of Ruth, Jesus coming in. I know we talked about that stuff. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll come up with something. You know, there's so many stuff to talk about in here. So, so many stories. You know, so much. I know one of these days I got to talk about um, Saul becoming Paul. Because that's an awesome story. I don't think I've done that one yet, but that's an awesome story. Abraham and Isaac, I know that's one that's got to be talked about. David and Goliath, I knew I do. I know I did that one. Yeah, Joan and the Whale, we might do that one. I don't think we did that yet. But anyway, we, we got all kinds of stuff to get to and to talk about. So you guys have yourself a great one, and I will see you in the next one. Thank you for listening to Religion Ho-Ho's Way. For a complete listing of episodes and shows, you can head to thehohoshow.com and click on the episode tab. See you next time.